All right, welcome to the second PowerPoint um, about biomes, this one focusing on the aquatic biomes. The learning objective here, uh, we're still in, we're in topic 1.3, aquatic biomes. We are still looking at ecosystems being the result of biotic and abiotic interactions. And the learning objective, describe the global, di global distribution and principal environmental aspects of aquatic biomes. And like usual, we'll go through the essential knowledge at the end. Here's the vocab if you want to copy this down. So just jumping into the biomes. These are also called aquatic life zones or just aquatic zones. And just like we had uh, temperature and precipitation um, as well as elevation and altitude being the principal, um, the principal abiotic factors that influence terrestrial biomes, aquatic biomes have their own set of abiotic factors. Uh, number one is salinity. These are kind of um, written in order, but number one is salinity. Number two, temperature, sunlight, turbidity, depth, nutrient availability, and the predominant currents of that area. All of those will influence the biome distribution. So we can split up biomes based off of the primary, um, the primary factor, which is salinity. Okay, so marine biomes, those are going to be salt water, and they are anywhere from 3 to 3.5 percent salt. Okay, um, note that it is salts, not salt. It's not just sodium chloride, it's a lot of other dissolved minerals um, and that dissolved ions in that water. Okay, the different ones estuaries, oceans, coastal wetlands, coastal zone, intertidal, coral reef, mangrove forests, salt lakes, and inland seas. Those are all what we would call marine even though um, salt lakes are, you know, confined by land, right? Freshwater biomes, we have ponds and lakes, rivers and streams, inland wetlands. We'll talk about each of these individually. One way to organize the, um, the oceanic biomes, the marine biomes, is to look at depth. So that's what we're going to start with. The open ocean is going to be divided into these zones. There's the epipelagic zone, which is the very top few meters of, um, of the ocean, and this diagram from 0 to 200 meters. And that's where there's enough light for photosynthesis. Okay, uh, the mesopelagic is the twilight zone that starts where there's 1% of the incident light that strikes the surface that reaches that zone. It ends where there's no visible light. Okay, so we're starting right here with about 1% light and starting here or ending here with 0% light. Okay, um, down beneath that is the bathypelagic zone. That's 1,000 meters to 4,000 meters. The average temperature is 4 degrees Celsius. There is dissolved oxygen in this, so it's oxygenated. We would call that dissolved oxygen, or DO. And there is no visible light. Beneath that is the abyssopelagic. You'll see that abyss um, down, I, uh, root word. That's below 4,000 meters. The average temperature is 1 to 2 degrees Celsius, so just above freezing. Little or no oxygen and obviously no light. The hadopelagic, coming from the root word of Hades, the Greek uh, version of the underworld, um, that's within ocean trenches. So you'll see these um, only in trenches like the famous Mariana Trench. And then we have the benthic. That is the um, brown color here. That is the ocean floor. Okay. Regardless of depth, the depth could be um, right off the coast and it could be five meters the benthic zone would still be the ocean floor. You could also have it on the lake floor. So wherever you have um, the substrate, that's where the benthic zone is. Okay. There is um, this other uh, diagram that I just copied and pasted from Wikipedia showing the layers, the pelagic zone um, containing <clears throat> all of these zones beneath it. When we're talking about the photic zone, we can also refer to the epipelagic as the photic zone. Um, epi basically meaning at the top um, or above, but in this case, the top. And then the, beneath that is the, oh, I should back up and say the photic zone is light. The a photic zone is no light. So that root word a or um, prefix a means no or not. And then we have, um, these zones, just like we had over here, going down from there. Um, meso basically means middle. Bathy, um, I don't know exactly, but it means deep um, in, in whatever sense. Um, 
like, like a bathtub, I guess. And then Abyss, very deep. And then Hades, um, down in hell. And then um, beneath that, we're not going to worry about the Demessal, but the Benthic. So this is just um, layering the ocean based off of depth. You will obviously have different organisms at different depths um, of the ocean, and they're adapted to those different um, depths. One thing that you should know um, is that pressure increases as you go further down. So as you go further down, you have more and more and more water weighted down above you, and that is going to cause the pressure to increase. The other thing is down here in the... Um, you know, even the mesopelagic, but definitely the bathopelagic and abyssopelagic, most of the nutrients are coming from marine snow that is drifting down from above. Marine snow is dead and decaying organic matter, and it is um, the source of most of the nutrients um, in these deeper zones. You will have some deep sea hydrothermal vents that will create their own little communities down here, um, but most of the nutrients are coming from um, marine snow. Um, why marine biomes are important? The ocean comprises about 96.5% of the Earth's water, so that is a huge amount of the Earth's volume of water, as well as two-thirds of its surface. It's extraordinarily important, helps regulate the climate, helps to um, absorb lots of um, carbon dioxide. Most of, well, m much of the emissions that we have um, put into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution have been absorbed by the ocean. Okay. They're important for nutrient cycling, waste treatment. You guys can read through the rest of these. I'm not going to list them off. It is also enormously biodiverse. If we look at evolutionarily where life started, they believe that it originated in the oceans and is still extraordinarily biodiverse. At the surface in the photic zone, the, um, the main source of energy is sunlight. Um, and obviously that's going to be trapped by producers creating um, creating organic molecules and starting off the food web up there. Um, most of those producers are going to be algae, some photosynthetic bacteria, um, but mostly algae. Okay. Um, and again, you guys should know these ecosystem services. We're going to differentiate the different types of ecosystem services. There are four types of ecosystem services later on the semester. For right now, I'm just um, lumping these all into ecosystem services, and it's basically what the environment does um, for us, okay, what we get from the environment. So like I said, um, the producers in most marine ecosystems are going to be photosynthetic bacteria and algae, um, algae outnumbering the photosynthetic bacteria most of the time. If those are microscopic, which all bacteria are and many algae are, we call them um, phytoplankton, and then if they're macroscopic, we'll call them algae and kelps. So um, mostly if it's macroscopic, it's gonna be an algae or a kelp, but if it's microscopic, we'll collectively refer to those photosynthetic um, bacteria and protists, um, which are the algae, as um, phytoplankton. Okay, they're at the base of food of the food chains in the marine ecosystem. Even like I said, if you go all the way down to the abyssopelagic, um, where it'll be marine snow that is the dead and decaying um, matter from phytoplankton, from um, animals, from animal waste, all of that stuff from the surface. We could also have some other producers. So if it's um, at a coastal system, we can have mangrove um, forests. If it's a tropical, coastal, or subtropical, um, tropical or subtropical coastal system, we could have a kelp forest. We could have a seagrass meadow. Okay, if it's a shallow coastal zone where seagrasses dominate. Okay, so there are other producers than just photosynthetic bacteria and algae. Okay, um, you can also have corals, which is a photos. I'm sorry, which is a symbiotic, mutualistic symbiotic relationship between um, algae and um, animals, the coral polyps. And another ecosystem service, about half of the oxygen um, in the atmosphere comes from the marine photosynth photosynthesizers. So they're extremely important. So think about that, like take one breath and then take another breath. One of those two breaths came exclusively from the ocean system, the other from the land system, okay? And the last thing here is that marine biomes, just connecting this back to ecosystems, marine biomes tend to have more trophic levels than terrestrial biomes. You can often have five, six, seven, eight trophic levels because you have, um, because you're starting with such small organisms where micro, 
uh, microscopic plankton, the, these phytoplankton, will be eaten by zooplankton, which will be eaten by small fish, will be, which will be eaten by um, slightly larger fish, will be eaten by middle-sized fish, which will be eaten by large fish, which can be eaten by a seabird, or actually let's say that it's eaten by a penguin, which can then be eaten by a sea lion, and that sea lion can then be eaten by an orca. Okay, so you can have many, many levels in the food chain. Okay, many trophic levels, much more than you see on land. All right. Some human impacts on marine biomes, um, obviously pollution is a very big one. Pollution in some cases can lead to eutrophication. So that's also a really big one. We'll talk about that um, kind of ad nauseum later on in the school year. Um, loss of, um, just loss of habitat, whether those are wetlands, mangrove forest, seagrass meadow, for whatever reason. If it's a mangrove forest, it could be um, for timber harvesting or for charcoal. If it's um, a seagrass meadow, it could be to set up an aquaculture um, production where you raise shrimp. Whatever reason, um, it could be that you are um, that you are essentially extending the coastline by creating artificial islands or artificial coast, just dumping in tons and tons and tons, truckloads of sand and extending your coastline so that you can extend your cities. Okay, something like what's happening in the Netherlands. Rising sea levels are going to displace habitat. Um, we'll talk about that in class, but say that you have um, your continental um, shelf, your coastline, your ocean right there. As we get higher and higher up, the corals that are living just right here in this zone will have to migrate further and further up, and the um, ocean may rise faster than the corals can move. Okay, that's just one example, but we could have loss of terrestrial biomes due to sea level rise. We can have loss of aquatic biomes due to sea level rise. And we'll also talk about that in class a little bit more. I have an activity that we'll do, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, coral reefs um, being damaged due to rising temperature, ocean acidification, physical damage, such as um, dredging, anchors, and the tra and trawling activity, which we'll talk about later on the semester. Okay, so that's just a very broad overview of the marine biomes. We'll talk about some more specifics, especially when we're talking about the coastal zone, the intertidal zone, all of that stuff with your biome project. So this is just a broad overview um, and we'll get more details with your biome project. Well, let's transition to freshwater biomes. Freshwater accounts for about 1% of the total water on earth. So you'll notice that that does not add up to 90, I'm sorry, to 100%. The remaining water um, is trapped in groundwater and ice. So we are not including groundwater and ice in this 1%, okay? So think about all of the water that you've ever seen in lakes, rivers, and even the largest lakes like, um, like the Great Lakes um, or really large rivers like the Mississippi, that is only 1% of water on Earth. So surface fresh water is only about 1% of water on Earth. Extremely precious resource. Okay. And all life is going to depend, or at least almost all life, uh, terrestrial life is going to depend on fresh water in one way or another. Okay. The ecosystem services for um, freshwater systems, I will let you read through these because I'm not gonna list all of them to you. And just like with marine biomes, we're gonna get more details on the specific freshwater biomes um, in our biome project. So hold off on those, but recall that the, um, that the freshwater biomes are ponds and lakes. Um, we have rivers and streams. And then finally, wetlands, inland wetlands, not coastal wetlands, but inland wetlands, freshwater wetlands. Okay, so we're basically looking at ponds and lakes as the um, as water not really moving much, where water is held in a large um, large reservoir, um, not to be confused with a reservoir behind a dam, but you know, in a large bowl, water is being held. Rivers and streams, water is flowing. And then wetlands, water is being held also. Water is flowing really slowly. It's basically a shallow um, shallow and over a large area. 
Okay. Some of the human impacts, pollution. Okay. So about 40% of U.S. rivers are too polluted for fishing or swimming or both in many cases. So there will be, um, especially if you go into industrial centers, you might see signs that say, uh, do not consume fish from this lake um, or do not, uh, no swimming, whatever it is. Uh, damming, this will alter the flow of the river. This will um, alter the area upstream, specifically flooding it, cuts off um, migration routes for migratory fishes. We'll talk about those a lot more later on in the semester. Diverting water for irrigation. So the example that I have here, or one of the two, is that the Colorado River Delta basically is almost dry right there's we're, we're removing so much water from the colorado river most of it for irrigation but a lot of it for urban use as well that it barely reaches the gulf of california that the delta is basically dry okay uh sediment delivery um this is related to damming so damming will upset the sediment delivery and you won't have this nutrient rich sediment that you should have at the mouth of most rivers reaching the ocean and um recall that this area right here is the estuary and the estuary is really really rich or supposed to be because all of this nutrients is flowing from the river um, from the land into the river dumping into the ocean okay you can obviously have too much of a good thing and if you have too many nutrients it'll lead to a eutrophication event but you should have um, some nutrients flowing into um, down the mouth of the river or out of the mouth of the river leading to really productive estuaries okay just like with the um, with the marine biomes, we're going to talk about these ad nauseum later on in the school year. So this is just a very brief overview. And I just wanted to mention some of the main ones um, because we're talking about biomes and human impacts on them. Um, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. All right, so getting back to the learning objectives, the essential knowledge. Uh, freshwater biomes include streams, rivers, lakes, and ponds. Um, they are a vital source of drinking water. Many ecosystem services, but a big one is drinking water. Okay, marine biomes, uh, we talked about those. We talked about how algae is the primary, uh, is at the base of the food chain, and that they supply a very large um, part of the oxygen um, that we breathe. I didn't mention it, but they also take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we'll talk about how carbon dioxide can be sequestered in marine sediments, and much of that is due to um, is due to the biotic activity, specifically the producers in that aquatic system or that marine system. And then the global distribution of non-mineral marine natural resources, such as the different types of fish, varies because of some combination of salinity, depth, turbidity, nutrient availability, and temperature. Again, we'll talk about these throughout the rest of the semester. The main one here is salinity but we'll talk about those ecosystem services, specifically those provisioning services, the natural resources that these provide later on in the school year. Okay, so I'll see you all in class.